Welcome back, everyone, to the short break uh, to the search track of the ApacheCon 2021. Um, for this uh, session, we have two speakers uh, for the search track. Uh, the first speaker is Nazar K. Sidan. She's a solo contributor who's active in the open source uh, community for her day job, software engineer, Salesforce, and prior to which she has worked in turn at places CERN and Cloudera working on search and big data. Uh, along with her, we also have David Smiley, a longtime search veteran and a Apache Lucene and Solar Committer and PMC member, um, who also works at Salesforce. Uh, David is passionate about software development and contributing to open source and has presented at various conferences and published multiple books. Uh, today, both of them are going to be sharing hope with us with various strategies around managing custom uh, plugins and forks of solar in the real world system. Um, so over to you. Thanks. Thanks for the introduction. <clears throat> um, so our the agenda here is a little bit of background at first, and then we'll uh, then I'll discuss testing a fair amount. In retrospect, I should have put testing in the title. It's um, um, I worked on testing of solar plugins for a while, and there's a lot that we have to share here. Uh, after that, um, Nizerki will discuss uh, forking a, a project. Uh, we'll say it with regards to solar, but actually a lot of stuff is really in common with any open source project. You may be pondering whether to fork or not. Uh, and finally, um, composing, which is a, composing you know, your plugins with solar together with Docker, you know, how, to, how to manage that. Okay. So a key takeaway with search in general is that search is, um, compared to a database, say, is search is more of a platform. It is something you build on. It is something that needs to be very extensible, pluggable, reconfigurable in many ways, much more than uh, typical software products like, like a database, um, which is not to say that some people don't get in there and, and tweak their database and, and um, plug something in maybe, but that that is much more rare than a search platform, which really needs this because um, there's just so many specific user requirements around search that, that um, for your application, you end up wanting to tweak it in some way and you really have to get in there and mess around and, and configure a whole bunch of things that are configurable and maybe even write your own. So examples of plugins that I'm talking about here are uh, Token Filter from Lucene, uh, a Solar Request Handler. Uh, there are many more. These are basically classes or interfaces that you can extend and then plug in by, by name and configuration. Uh, Lucene and Solar come with an extreme number of these things, um, and you need to be able to provide your own in some cases. Um, I, I further, further, stay, further state that you it's typical to start off using Solar as a as a um, a product and and not hacking it so much directly, and then start working with those plugins that it provides, and then eventually. Um, if necessary, you might find, you know what, I need a really a custom filter right here. Maybe you've gotten some, gotten by with a regex for a while, but you need to do something a bit more specific. Maybe it's for performance. Um, when you when you get into this level, it's 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 uh, on, on a, um, often it's performance related in some way, but not necessarily. There can be other other reasons to um, to really kind of need sometimes to get in there and write your own. So it's kind of a progression. You start off with the, with a um, it's, it's a bit more like a black box and you begin to understand it, begin to configure it more and eventually get to the point that you have your own custom plugins. And it may be, it may be eventually um, even a fork of solar, but hopefully not that stage. I'll start with testing plugins. Um, so I've been working with Lucene and solar for many years and it, it, it's a vast code base uh, that, that is Lucene and Solar likewise and including their tests. Um, it's easy if you're starting a project where you need to have a custom say a token filter or something like this, it's easy to ignore um, the fantastic offerings that, that Lucene offers in the form of the Lucene test framework jar. And likewise, there's a solar test framework jar as well. As well, so the solar project and the Lucene project both not only produce, you know, Lucene core jar. In the case of solar, would be a running server which, which um, has code in jars, but also um, test artifacts that gets published to Maven Central with a variety of utilities. And I, I highly recommend that you you check them out if you're writing your own plugins. Um, in particular, on the Lucene side, there's a base class 
Lucene test case. Uh, there's a bunch of randomization utilities in there, uh, provides easy ways to create, create um, in-memory indices and, and to configure them. Um, but I think some of the most useful pieces by far inside the Lucene test framework from my perspective are base token stream test case, which has many utilities around uh, testing a token stream. So any part of the token stream you're working on, whether it's a kill filter, token tokenizer, or a token filter, or an analyzer, packages the whole thing. Um, there are many rules that Lucene insists on, and there are utilities there that really help insist that your your um, that your implementation abides by those rules. There's also some uh, low-level codex. Think think here like the actual terms index or doc values. If you're um, getting to the level of sophistication where you have your own postings format or doc values, as we've done here in, at Salesforce, um, there's some nice utilities in there to help you make sure that your um, your postings format you know meets the spec. And furthermore, uh, I'd further state that if you are getting to that level of providing your own you know postings format or such, uh, it, it can be advantageous to um, develop it with within a say a fork of Lucene such that you can have the entirety of the Lucene test framework run with maybe your postings format or your doc values format, um, and it can pick it by configuration, which is um, which can save you a lot of time testing uh, later because a lot of the tests are effectively already written for you. The solar test framework, <clears throat> uh, there's a base class solar test case J4. Um, I have mixed feelings of recommending that you use it directly in your test um, in, in your on your plugins in your code because it has a lot of a great deal of um, warts that have been put there over the years that's grown and grown and grown. I think it's uh, in need of a, a renovation of taking the best parts and putting those in a base class. I have opinions on that and a solar issue. Um, but in particular, uh, of really high value in the solar test framework, there's um, base distributed search test case. If you're working on a search component that works in distributed search mode, in general, the idea with solar with distributed search is you want solar to return the same results, whether it's a single shard or whether it's whether you have a, a collection that's sharded. So this class helps make sure that there is parity between a single and, and multiple uh, multiple shards. Solar Cloud Test Case is an awesome base class for doing a solar cloud level test. It uses something called um, Solar Cloud Test Case itself is pretty simple. Um, most of the interesting parts are in Mini Solar Cloud Cluster, which is uh, basically this object you can instantiate a solar cloud cluster and interact with solar. Uh, then there's Embedded Solar Server, which is a it's actually a subclass of Solar Client but it actually is an embedded solar server within there. And that's really appropriate for uh, non-solar cloud and single solar core scenarios. I mean, I guess you could, it might be usable with more than one core, but it's kind of intended for um, testing a great number of components that operate within one core. In Jetty Solar Runner, if you wanna bring things to the HTTP level, if you have to test somehow some HTTP interaction, because embedded solar server is so low level that there's no, Jetty is, is out of the picture. Um, I, here I'm trying to share um, an approach to how to write, um, to basically write tests in such a way that it can be tested in multiple modes of solar. So I mentioned, I kind of hinted at before with embedded solar server, and I mentioned a few of these classes um, I've already mentioned up here, embedded solar, jetty solar, and mini solar cloud cluster. These are three utilities provided by solar test framework. And imagine writing a test that needs to just, you know, index and query some data. But imagine it being written in such a way that it gets a solar client somehow. And it's it could be running against, again, embedded solar or Jetty or solar cloud. And it being basically being tested across these modes. So uh, I've done this. Uh, I've done this at
Yeah, seems like uh, we lost David, but he's he's on his way back. Again? Yeah. That's a bad luck. Okay. But I am ready to go with my screen sharing it. And we're two presenters, so if worst comes to worst, Nizerki could take over as well. Uh, here I am. You see me okay? Yes, I do see you. Great. Okay. And do you, does everybody see Nizerki? I don't see Nizerki. Oh, there she is. Okay. Okay. So I'll resume where I left off. Um, what I want to communicate here about these test modes is the idea of writing a test in such a way that it doesn't, um, and, okay, if you're writing a test that is fundamentally about solar cloud and using solar cloud features, then fine. Um, but there are many features that, there are many things you might want to test that don't really fundamentally care or are related to how you're running solar. Um, so it, it's nice if you could run it, write a test that that um, uses SolarJ, Solar Client, indexes some documents, queries, and you instantiate that solar client in a multitude of ways, uh, which are the different modes of running solar. You look at whether it's embedded, whether, um, furthermore, it's embedded, but with HTTP Jetty, whether it's solar cloud mode, and furthermore, even with Dockerized solar. So I've done this, we're doing this at, at Salesforce for our plugins. I've done this uh, in the past for a previous large company that uses solar. Um, and I think this approach is really fantastic. And I'm, I'm trying to, and because it, it enables you to find problems in your, um, it, 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 if you don't do this, you end up writing your test saying using a particular mode of solar that you that you hard coded it to use. And you may not know that there's some bad interaction with solar cloud or something like this or distributed search or something um, that you may, that you, you don't know until, until potentially much later. Um, and it also means that tests are more, more transferable. If you write a test a certain way um, using standard solar client, it's just more um, it's just more familiar rather than having to do very special things just because it's embedded solar, or just because it's solar cloud. So there's a Jira issue up here, solar 11872, that um, it's not uh, exactly about this. There's a, a very high overlap between the idea on the slide here and um, and that issue. That issue there in Jira is a um, uh, one of the things it proposes is creating a utility that would go in solar test framework that would enable you to more easily do this. Um, again, I've done this like twice now, written it from scratch, um, it's not it's not a ton of code, and it tends to be somewhat how you create it can be somewhat specific to your company and how you're starting stuff, especially the Docker side. Um, but the ideas here, I think, are, are really good. Um, on, on the Docker side, I'll point out that you can. There's a couple ways to um, work with Docker in your test. You can use a wonderful utility called Test Containers, which is an open source product that uh, for Java that enables you to work with Docker. Um, or there, there are other ways to do it. Um, what, what, what test containers does is allows you to actually write some sort of base class or base utility that actually does this Docker uh, manipulations. Um, another approach is using some sort of Maven plugin that, that um, does integration tests. I think I've seen one from um, one contributed by Spotify and that there are other ones that can arrange for a Docker image to be ru um, run for the duration of your, uh, of your whole test run. And so basically we have a bunch of tests and some of those tests have annotations that say, you know, I don't work with solar cloud maybe, or I require, or I assume that I'm working with a collection that only has one shard versus more than one. And it's okay to do these kinds of things because you will have tests that fundamentally just aren't designed to be to work in, in certain scenarios. And that's still okay, but we can run the same, run the same test, the entire test suite. And we run it in embedded mode versus Jetty versus um, solar cloud. And so we're able to, um, test a multitude of, of scenarios and in some cases, some cases find find bugs. That's the idea here. Uh, randomized testing. So uh, randomized testing is a philosophy of how to write tests, some tests, and it's uh, not a black and white thing. You can use a little bit of randomized testing or a lot of randomized testing. Um, it is something that Lucene and Solar embraces tremendously. And it's something that I personally um, began to really appreciate. And I felt like my, my testing skills grew a lot when I began to really embrace these ideas. Um, what randomized testing does is it's more than just some random variable that you don't need some library for. Um, but there is a library that can help, uh, that, that basically makes your test repeatable using a, a seed. So the randomized testing lib on, on GitHub there 
use spirulina solar, by the way, will will randomly generate a seed if you don't provide it. And when there is a failure, it tells you the seed so that you can run that test that failed with the seed and thereby hopefully reproduce it. It may not be re reproducible anyway due to you know concurrency or other sorts of things that can happen on any test. Um, but uh, the idea here is that you're able to try combinations of things that um, at, at random and thus get much more um, test exposure across different components having interactions together um, and, and or different inputs that are maybe at their edge boundary in, in concert with other things that produce bugs that you never thought to test for. <clears throat> so you can, and so it also facilitates testing with uh, random data, sometimes constrained in some way, like, like ASCII looking text versus totally random Unicode characters. Um, and you can, um, as I've worked on spatial search, I've, I've really embraced that there. Um, so even if you're not, we're not working on spatial search, the idea here is that if you have a, um, it, it, uh, if, you, if you can, so the search index can, is basically giving you very quick answers via an index to whether um, a query matches um, index data. So I, I had a, a very trivial brute force approach that I could check to see if it's correct. And then there's the search index that was producing should be producing the very same answer, obviously faster. And using randomization, I could randomly produce some data, randomly produce some queries, and I could know absolutely whether which queries are supposed to match which documents in a brute force way, obviously slow, but the search index, I could then make sure that it was always producing the very same results. And that was, this, this approach was fantastic in producing all sorts of edge cases that I never would have dreamed up. And I, 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 I would, like, I, I'd almost say that for, um, numerical and, and spatial that this approach is, um, yeah, it's just huge benefits. Um, I have, we've also used it like um, locally at Salesforce, um, the, the, the principles here for fuzz testing your analysis chain. So this is, um, again, uh, so think of your analysis chain, a bunch of a bunch of text and you produce a bunch of terms. There are many different text uh, examples of text that shows up in the real world. And, and uh, you can write a random test, especially using Lucene's um, base tokenizer, uh, I mentioned uh, a test utility, it, it can check a lot of uh, invariance against your token stream to make sure that it's meeting the API, no matter what crazy characters and, and uh, interesting combinations um, show up there. And Lucene uses it a lot, Solar uses it a lot to, to randomly choose in equivalent implementations of a given abstraction, whether that's a postings format or a codec or, or merge policy or things like this. Um, I will say it's, it's not all rosy, I mean, I, I'm, I really embrace it, but it does have a cost, and that that cost will be um, finding out that your test, you know, that that ultimately that, that that it's your test that needs to be tweaked a little bit because it didn't consider some scenario. Um, but every now and then, your your that test will find something real because of randomized testing, and it feels great when that happens. This is a collection of tips here on on testing. Um, with, with Lucene and Solar and search in general. Uh, okay, starting at the top left, avoid needless um, scoring and ranking assumptions in your tests that don't need to be there. It's so easy to write a test that says, this query is gonna find these 10 documents in exactly this order because that's like the easy way to write it. But if your test doesn't actually care about the ranking, it's just caring what you match, then make sure that it can pass no matter what the order is. Uh, because if the, the moment you change your approach to ranking, you don't want to update a bunch of tests that shouldn't be caring about that. Um, index and matrix, uh, index and query, I'll show you an example of that in the next slide. Um, if using mocking frameworks, um, people have strong opinions on this. I certainly do. I hate them. But if you do use them, uh, please use them very judiciously. There's lots of, uh, um, just, if you're writing in, in solar, um, uh, solar test framework, which depends on solar core, that you can often use the real thing without using, without having to resort to a mock, often, for things like solar params and whatnot, and solar query request. Uh, top right, uh, definitely pre prefer um, test methods that are self-contained. In other words, you look at the test method, you see what it's indexing, what it's querying, and what it matches. That's a, that's, that's a great scenario. Um, if you uh, have a test class that, that indexes a bunch of stuff up top, and then you have all these test methods. Um, it can get unwieldy over the long term and starts to be difficult to maintain and know why something matches or what was intended as different people touch it. 
Finally, in my opinion, avoid, um, if, assuming that you're working on, uh, you have some token, custom token filters and, and maybe query parser, I would, um, uh, so tokenization level tests and query parser output Lucene query structure tests are fine, but I would recommend not having, you know, too many of these and instead um, have, have, have a decent amount, but then uh, I would balance that out much more with high level index this data, does this query match this document? Because that is very, you can communicate that. And I'll show you an example on the next slide here. Um, this, this, this right at this point very much relates to what I call this test matrix. Um, so here we have, imagine this is all fitting within one method. We have some little utility thingy. Um, it, it makes it super concise to test indexing um, a, a certain list of documents and then running a list of queries against those same documents to see which documents you match. And the beauty of this on the slide here is that it's self-contained. It's not like you've got some index stuff going on at the very top of the class and then way down below, you've got some, you have to figure out which documents matching. So it's together, it's, 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 it's uh, contained. Um, number two, um, it's very readable. It almost reads like requirements, which is a very good thing. Um, it makes it much easier to judge this as a peer reviewer, like, is this doing what we want it to do? Yeah, and I, I call this a test matrix. The idea is that across the, the original idea was that um, across one, um, say the the, uh, the the columns would be imagine the indexed data, and the and the rows are queries, and you query against the same in, input. Often hope, you'd hope you'd find the same input, um, and then many other variations down below. Okay, next Ms. Zerky will cover this. Uh, forking projects. Um, next slide, please, dude. Avoid forking or no forking. Uh, by fork, I mean here, um, make a departure from open source repository so that it will prevent us contributing back to the uh, open source project. And so why not fork? Because in the beginning, it might seem easy and free uh, and the harmless thing to do. Uh, and even it might appear uh, to increase your uh, productivity, velocity at first, but in the long term, the maintenance of it um, um, costs very high. So it is expensive. So instead, yeah. before uh, forking a project, um, consider uh, working with the community upstream uh, through uh, Jira or a ma uh, mailing list, etc. Um, you could discuss your ideas uh, with the community before investing too much time uh, into your solution. Uh, maybe you could find uh, alternative proposals by, uh, provided by the community, and, and also you could uh, you can ask for extension points so that you can plug in. Uh, for example, uh, Configset API, Configset Service API. And at Salesforce, we have a, our own uh, hybrid Configset Service API, which is an extension of Configset Service that is pluggable, actually. Uh, if uh, if you couldn't find a solution, maybe find some other way, maybe runtime manipulation for your Java agents. Um, so, but of course, this is like practically this sometimes you have to, or you must fork a project. Uh, but if you must, uh, you must fork a project, you have to be very careful with your fork. So, because it's easy to change and to make some changes. And, and, but then if you introduce a lot of change, then it's the problem would be the divergence. Uh, from the open source project. Basically, you are getting off the train of the development of the open source project. Uh, next slide, please, David. Um, actually, there is a really good uh, Salesforce uh, blog post uh, about life work uh, philosophy written by an architect at Salesforce. Um, six rules for open source code management. Basically, uh, this blog post introduced the life work uh, principle. So a life work means that you resist changes as, as, much, uh, as much as possible. So, and bring upstream change when possible, for example, cherry picks, uh, and then don't defer upgrades uh, for too long uh, because upgrades usually refresh and resets your fork. Um, 
So basically, keep your fork uh, very light, even though it is hard uh, to do it uh, as possible. Um, so, and next, please, David. Sorry. Mm -hmm. So the up voice here, this, the main point here is just to, uh, to give some uh, tips and uh, which makes upgrades easier uh, that we usually do at Salesforce. Uh, so in your fork, maintain your change MD file. And so that whenever you have to introduce some changes or modify something in your fork, just update uh, that file and with real good commit messages. And before upgrading to any open source release, uh, releases, um, carefully review uh, open source uh, versions uh, in order to make sure that they are fully stable and suitable um, uh, so that it can be used in your production environment uh, without a low risk. Um, the upgrade process. Um, during upgrade process, Basically, you could, in the beginning, you could do, you know, if it is like a patch upgrade, um, minor versions upgrade, then you could apply git merge. Uh, if you are lucky enough, um, so you you won't get any merge conflicts. Uh, but uh, practically at Salesforce, we use git rebase. Um, there are uh, many um, uh, useful uh, useful uh, cases for why we use git uh, rebase. One example would be is, um, would be the skipping the commits that are obsolete. Um, for example, doing uh, doing our uh, doing our de uh, development, so we cherry pick up a lot of stuff from upstream. But doing upgrade, we can easily skip the cherry picks. Um, so then GitHub base allows us to do it. And then also, it's an opportunity to squash and rework uh, when it's appropriate. Um, mm -hmm. And composition of solar plugins and Docker. Um, this basically um, this graph or uh, this uh, approach zero diagram uh, describes the main or general idea of composition. So there are two parts, public and a private one. So uh, I want you to uh, pay attention to the bottom part. That's a plugins uh, source control repository. That's that is in your uh, private or corporate company, basically. That uh, the public part for now it's not important. So here we assume we don't have a solo fork. So plugins uh, repo, repo, repository basically depends on solar core jars dependencies and then solar official uh, Docker image, etc. So then we in plugins we build our own uh, jar own um, jars dependencies and then we publish somewhere. So then we produce our Docker image for plugins. So the here the main idea is just we have our repo and we don't care where we get our um, dependencies jars. So that's not important in this uh, approach zero. The main idea is just uh, we are dependent on um, solar jars dependencies in the image. The next approach, basically approach one, uh, in this case, we use solar fork. So that is uh, on the top part. So the bottom part is the same as the approach zero. We have the plugins repo and all this stuff. And then the top part, basically, instead of getting some the kind of, you know, jars dependencies from somewhere else, we have our own fork that is uh, in a diff diff in different source control repository. Um, and then we first build solar fork and we publish all the same solar jars dependencies to our internal repository and we produce Docker image. Once we build it, then we can use that jars dependencies in our plugins. Uh, this is the current uh, composition that we use at Salesforce currently. This is the only one way of doing composition, actually. So we are not saying this is perfect, one way. Uh, of course, there are other ways uh, to compose it. Um, and then also, I want to mention uh, here, uh, in solar work, uh, we have uh, Docker a solar uh, repo contents as well. So in solar work, uh, we just uh, put all the contents of uh, Docker repo uh, in it. But starting from nine, solar nine, it will go away. 
because uh, solar nine uh, um, it comes with uh, belt. Um, the alternatives. Right. Um, so we've been doing this for a while. Um, the structure there is is somewhat obvious, I guess. Um, but maybe there's a case of uh, there's a feeling the grass is always greener on the other side. So even though we do it this way, there are some pain points. Uh, number one is that if you're working on the solar the solar fork side, um, whatever it may be, if you want to actually run solar, but of course it's never just running just solar by itself. It's with the plugins and everything, and maybe even fitting into a larger um, integration. Uh, you're like another further step away. We're one more step away. So you have to produce some jars, you have to do Docker image, then you have to go to the plugin side and then then do a build there with a new update on against it, like a snapshot or something like this. Um, this is a pain. I've written a, you know, like locally a little how to to um, kind of short circuit this. Um, basically the idea is that uh, assuming that you're not making a change on the plugin side and you're only making a change on the solar fork side, you can run the very same uh, Docker image locally on your machine with a volume mount uh, at the path into solar where the jars would go. Therefore, instead of getting them from the image, you can send them, map them to your machine where you're doing solar development, thereby getting the very latest jars you've just built. And so um, that's a relatively typical um, tip or technique for doing Docker development in general. And if you use that tip, that can uh, it can basically address this, but still, it's not all perfect. Um, in your IDE, it's like um, if, if you're working on the solar side and, this, and, and you want to debug that, if you happen to step into a plugin uh, provided by on the plugin side, that IDE environment doesn't see it. So, uh, you know. We also, by the way, can originally considered maybe putting the Docker aspect into entirely into another repo of its own. Um, but that would be just, <laughs> that would make the previous point I just made about it being awkward. Uh, that would be yet another place to go change something. But that was something we considered as well. It had an advantage of just seeming more, um, I don't know, it had a more, it, it looked nice on paper, but from a practical standpoint, I think it would overall be more effort. Mm -hmm. And that's a good segue here because the, uh, yeah, we're, we're considering this approach. And so Mr. can tell you about this one. Yeah, this is the approach too. This is basically still we have two repositories, plugins and solar for The different is, difference is this uh, Git submodule that we, uh, in this uh, diagram, we use plugins as a main repo, main project, and then solar fork as a, a Git submodule. Uh, so that we don't have to, uh, you don't have to publish any jars and dependencies uh, uh, of solar fork actually, so that you, uh, you use Git submodule and still you use in plugins. And only one Docker image is produced here. So that is plugins Docker image. Um, and then also there's uh, the one um, advantage is and dev environment friendly. Basically, whenever you're debugging things, you don't have to build solar and then publish a Docker image and then use in plugins. So um, you just have to update this module. Um, but the, the what, another downside of using GitHub module is, uh, is basically it's not trivial uh, working with GitHub module, um, especially if the uh, sort of work is changing is changing frequently and you have to update the module very often. So uh, it it will be complex. So that's why I think um, if we are comfortable with it, if we learn it, I think it's manageable and feasible to do it. Mm, so this is the approach. Currently, this is not in prod, so we are experimenting. Um, so currently, uh, with our uh, with our dev uh, branch. So, um, when you build plugins for solar, um, I recommend making it clear what version of solar you're doing it that it's compatible with <clears throat> um, so basically in the plugins repo instead of having just a main branch imagine having main dash 8.6 okay it's just a, just just a suggestion um, i think this is clear <clears throat> um take it or leave it 
Um, this would also mean that, like when you upgrade from 8.6 to 8.10, you would then have a main dash 8.10, um, et cetera. And, and, uh, but what even more important than whether, whether or not you wanna um, have branches like that, I think is, is versioning. So when you release a version of your, your plugins, instead of just having version um, 52 in this example, instead put the solar version dash and then whatever your, your hypothetical company name, and just act me here, dash, then your version. That way your version is, that way there's the entire version information there captures the solar side and your side <clears throat> together and, and even a little bit of a little a short version of your company name so that it's clear that th this, like what this is for and what it's like compatible with. Um, or you could potentially do a snapshot if you want. Um, and you don't have to do just an incrementing counter. You could do a git hash or you could do um, a two or three digit depending on if you want. Um, I think a counter kind of keeps things simple. Um, so, so I like this because it just makes it clear what is it compatible with. And that is it. Thank you for listening. Thank you for coming. Uh, if you have any Thank questions. You. Thank you, David and Nazirke. We got a few questions. Um, Mike asked, uh, are there any plans to contribute the matrix tester to open source? I thought about that one in particular. Um, I want to, first of all, it's incredibly simple what it is. <laughs> um, it's, it's, you, you could look at my slide and say, okay, well, I'll just make a utility that indexes and queries like that. Um, I think the bigger thing that I definitely want to contribute is the, on the test mode slide, I made a reference to solar dash 11, I forget what, um, that I've, I've been wanting to do that for years. And I've, um, I started to just barely start to put together um, a J unit test rule that allow you to declare a rule and therefore it has the life cycle to stop and start solar. And um, so I just started working on that. After all, I've already written this kind of thing twice. So this will be the third time. <laughs> okay. Um, so the, the other two questions kind of uh, happened that I asked a question and the other question kind of adds to that. It's kind of the same thing. So considering solar is a really, uh, solar is really pluggable. Can you highlight a few things that in needed that required you to fork the repository as opposed to uh, for, for those things to be just uh, plugins? So one reason is keeping you agile at your company to respond to a performance or a performance problem at scale or possibly a security issue. Um, so th that's like the bare minimum. And I think that was the main motivated example. Example: what, There's a reference to a, a blog post that Nizerki posted there. Um, and that, that senior architect was I think running the HBase team. And they, they, they contribute tons to HBase officially, you know, and, and they, and, um, you shouldn't want to run a fork, um, but by having a fork, you, you can respond quickly to a problem. You can quickly add logging and metrics in places where there wasn't a log or a metric to look closer at something that you need to keep an eye on or whatever. So, so having the fork in place um, positions you to be to um, to dig deeper and and solve things in production at scale. But beyond that, like that's the ideal case is that you only go that far. But once you have a fork then it's very, very tempting, too tempting to, oh, let's make that little change over there. Oh, let's make that change over there too. And the next, the, the worry is that you take that too far. So um, this, you know, so we, Salesforce, we can, we've, as I say, um, not so much in the, in the, the past in, in excessive beyond two years ago, but within the past couple of years, you know, we are active contributors. So this is often a, where we contribute locally something that we want to contribute to solar and already have, and maybe it's in version nine, but we're not yet on nine, say, for example, this enables us to, to use those. So that's again, the best story. And then there are some things that we just haven't gotten around to contributing yet, but we want to like making the, uh, the solar cloud router pluggable. It's not pluggable today. Our version has it pluggable. Um, I'll get there. Um, as big as an open source as fan as I am, I still have a backlog of things that I'd like to do if I had an infinite amount of time to contribute back. So there are some things like that that just hang out there. And there are some things, by the way, that uh, really frustrate us that cannot be contributed back. And like, like there's, an, there's a constructor we added on top of automaton query and we argued upstream and 
uh, Adrian uh, voted down. I don't know. So, you know, and, and you got to understand there's different different um, different motivations between the open source community because I have you know I have like the, the cross arm. I should have brought them over. I have my Salesforce hat. I have my Apache hat. And there's different uh, you know different motivations. Uh, when I'm wearing my Apache hat, I'm thinking long term code ownership. I'm thinking, um, am I introducing something that's going to confuse people or you know, um, and this is different concerns. And wearing my company hat, maybe I just, um, I don't actually think this way, but maybe I just want to contribute the codes so not to maintain it anymore, <laughs> whatever it is. You know, I don't think some people are so flippant like that. Um, there is an open source issue, by the way, in solar where I, I even took a picture of myself with my Apache hat on the JIRA issue. because so I wanted to make a clear point that that the extra, the extra scrutiny I was putting on that particular JIRA issue um, may have seemed like a pain to the contributor, um, but I was ultimately trying to keep the our users, our solo users, in mind first and foremost. And I didn't want to add something that was more complex, just because it was how you wrote it at the time. Uh, you know. Okay, to... that's uh, uh, that's pretty valid. Uh, I hear uh, agility and uh, uh, being on pre older versions uh, primarily as as the reason, but also. Uh, primarily agility, just wanting to get some things done uh, when the motivation is to get it done rather than find the right way to do it or the way that's more generic to do it. Okay. Um, I think we don't have any other questions so far. Um, and we're also out of time. So I'm assuming yeah. both of you are going to uh, hang around at the conference the next two days. So if anyone has any other questions related to this or anything else, Solar, uh, think both of them and uh, they should be, I'm guessing they'd be happy to help you. Yeah, Thank you so much, Ben and Nazareke. Yeah, Thank go ahead. You. Can I introduce one thing? I Furthermore, I, I think we, um, we, really, we, we solicit, we are very curious how, if other people have interesting approaches to some of this managing plugins, um, or a composition that, that we didn't think of, or or maybe you're doing get some module and you love it. We really very much like to hear about this. It's really an open discussion. We don't pretend to do it the right way. This is, we're sharing how we do it and suggesting that you could do it the same way. We've been down this road and we're very interested in hearing like, I don't know, how does Apple manage it or Bloomberg or whatever. Thanks. Okay, great. Thanks so much, uh, both of you. Uh, this was great and uh, in about, seven minutes we have the last talk of the day for the search track uh by tim potter uh and i hope to see all of you there uh that's gonna be one fun talk thank you Thanks.